Welcome to the final installment of our series exploring the fascinating world of the ether-based electron models. In our previous episodes we delved into the intricacies of both Lorentz's and Larmor's electron models, uncovering their unique perspectives and contributions. Now, in this concluding part, we will compare these two models side by side and draw insightful conclusions about their strengths, limitations and their impact on the development of theoretical physics. Before we dive in, I'd just like to bring your attention to some new designs I've created for my merch store. Some are inspired by the Electric Universe and some inspired by the Ether series. Links will be down below in the description, so grab yourself something unique for the summer and help support this channel in the process. That being said, let's dive in and find out more. Lorentz and Larmor held contrasting perspectives regarding the relationship between optics and electrodynamics. Lorentz aligned himself with the views of Maxwell and Helmholtz, who believed that optics should be derived from electrodynamics. This inclination was evident early on, as even in his dissertation Lorentz derived the laws of reflection and refraction of light from Maxwell's theory. In contrast, Larmor, influenced by William Thomson, disputed Maxwell's success in establishing optics on the foundations of electrodynamics. Instead, he believed that theories centred around the optical ether were more satisfactory and had greater potential to serve as the basis for a unified physical theory. This divergence in opinion shaped how the two theorists introduced electrons as fundamental subatomic carriers of electricity. According to Lorentz, the inclusion of electrons became necessary when applying the electromagnetic reduction of optics to phenomena involving the atomic structure of matter. Anomalous dispersion, in particular, indicated a connection between the propagation of light and atomic vibrators. The electromagnetic interpretation of this relationship led Lorentz to propose that the atomic vibrator should be perceived as a charged particle bound elastically. This idea seemed particularly natural to Lorentz, given his use of Helmholtz's version of Maxwell's theory, which depicted electric polarization as a local displacement of charge. Larmor's initial theory, which drew from McCullough's optical ether and the concept of vortex rings, did not inherently require the existence of subatomic charged particles. Instead, these particles were seen as secondary entities obtained by manipulating the strain vortices to explain phenomena like electrolysis and potentially chemical bonding. In Larmor's framework, ions did not play a significant role in polarization and conduction, which were attributed to intrinsic properties of the ether itself, its rotational elasticity and its ability to sustain vortical motion. However, the failure of the vortex explanation to account for both macroscopic and microscopic currents led Larmor to introduce electrons. Their inclusion became necessary after a significant internal crisis in his theory. Larmor came to regard electrons as an entity or singularity derived from the concept of the ether, while for Lorentz they represented the most natural link within the electromagnetic interpretation of certain optical phenomena. When one overcomes internal challenges, it is often perceived as a transcendental truth. Larmor's foundation in optical ether had further implications. Unlike Lorentz's perspective, Larmor's electrons were not regarded as independent entities, but as specific constructs of the ether itself. Larmor's theory was essentially monistic in nature, while Lorentz's was clearly dualistic. The rationale behind the stationary nature of the ether differed between the two theories. Larmor considered the ether to be stationary because it could not be otherwise. Singularities within McCullough's medium moved without dragging the medium along with it. Additionally, any velocity of the medium would have resulted in a magnetic field that was excessively strong to have gone undetected. On the other hand, Lorentz viewed the stationary nature of the ether as the simplest hypothesis directly compatible with the optics of moving bodies. Larmor's reluctance to base optics on Maxwell's theory stemmed from his dissatisfaction with Maxwell's dynamic considerations. 
he believed that Maxwell's Lagrangian treatment of a system of currents lacked a sufficient dynamical foundation because it lacked a clear depiction of the concealed motion occurring within the magnetic field. In comparison, previous optical theories, which often drew analogies between the ether and an elastic solid, fared better in this respect. Larmor sought to preserve the essence of McCullough's ether in his own theory, and even aimed to provide a dynamic illustration of its rotational elasticity. The fact that the ether differed fundamentally from any known substance was of no consequence to Larmor. Instead, he considered its peculiarities as further evidence of its ultimate nature. Lorentz demonstrated a great willingness to embrace the abstract dynamical foundations present in Maxwell's treatise. He dedicated considerable effort to generalizing and adapting it to the new electron theory. However, he eventually agreed with Larmor that relying solely on a mechanical interpretation was hardly satisfactory. This marked a point of divergence between the two theorists. In subsequent work, Lorentz felt tempted to abandon the idea of a mechanical foundation altogether, and instead focused directly on field equations and the Lorentz force. The electron theories proposed by both Larmor and Lorentz represented significant departures from Maxwell's original concept of charge and current. However, their histories and ultimate forms of departure differed in each case. Lorentz initially adopted Helmholtz's reformalization of Maxwell's theory, which defined charge and current as primitive concepts based on their action at a distance. In this framework, polarization was considered a secondary concept, a microscopic displacement of charge. In contrast, Maxwell's theory, or Faraday's conception, treated polarization as a fundamental concept from which the notion of charge and current were derived. Lorentz's departure from Maxwell's conception of charge and current reflected Helmholtz's earlier departure from Maxwell, with only the atomistic understanding of charge needing supplementation. After Hertz's experiments, Lorentz began to pay closer attention to Maxwell's ideas and grasp their significant aspects. He recognised that for Maxwell, electricity was akin to an incompressible fluid and that electric displacement represented the elastically resisted flow of this fluid in a dielectric medium. Furthermore, he understood that an electrification process required conferring conductivity upon the medium, and that the concept of electric charge stemmed from the notion of a field. However, Lorentz believed that this conception could only be applied at the microscopic level of the electron and free ether. Macroscopic displacement in material dielectrics involved the microscopic shifting of elastically bound electrons, while macroscopic conduction involved the nearly unhindered circulation of electrons. Ultimately, maintaining two separate intuitions of charge and current, an exclusively Maxwellian one for sub-electronic processes and a Weberian one for macroscopic phenomena, offered no advantage. In later writings, Lorentz exclusively adhered to Weber's concept, resulting in a dualistic theory based on the field and microscopic charges no longer considered constructs of the field itself. Larmor initially shared Maxwell's belief that the electric charge represented a discontinuity in displacement, and electric conduction arose from the relaxation of displacement. His first theory, which incorporated the vortex interpretation of electric currents, aligned with this perspective. Both Larmor and Maxwell held the notion that the displacement was a state of electric constraint, and that the presence of conduction currents and charges indicated a breakdown in the medium's elastic property. However, Larmor diverged from Maxwell's interpretation of displacement as an elastically resisted shift of an imaginary fluid. He recognised that this depiction merely illustrated the form of the total current and could not serve as the basis for a dynamic field theory. Larmor briefly considered Helmholtz's polarisation theory as an alternative, although it lacked dynamical attributes. Ultimately, he found the interpretation of the displacement as a twist in McCullough's ether more fitting, providing him with the desired dynamic framework. Concerning the electrodynamics and optics of moving bodies, Larmor's theory was still in its early stages when he encountered Lorentz's Versuch. Consequently, he adopted Lorentz's averaging methods and the technique of corresponding states. 
both theorists shared the same understanding of corresponding states, although they overlooked the crucial point that these states were measured in the moving frame of reference and that the correspondence theorem held precisely at every order of u over c. Their oversight stemmed from their belief that the principle of relativity applied to matter and ether, rather than matter alone. They both anticipated that motion relative to the ether would eventually be detected. However, Lorentz and Larmor diverged in their application of the correspondence theorem. Larmor, considering matter as composed of point singularities in the ether, could dispense with Lorentz's assumption regarding the internal structure of electrons and the behaviour of molecular forces. To determine corresponding states, Larmor only needed to consider the ether field and the corresponding field equations. While this simplification was significant, it failed to impress continental electron theorists who remained sceptical of Larmor's concept of matter. Ultimately, there existed a stark contrast in form and perspective between Lorentz's and Larmor's theories. Lorentz rejected the notion of an ultimate foundation for physical theory and sought only the simplest and clearest basic assumptions. Larmor, on the other hand, viewed the rotational ether as the ultimate entity and regarded the resulting electron theory as part of a new transcendent aesthetics. This philosophy of the ether clashed with the methodical rigour of earlier leading Maxwellians such as Heaviside and Hertz, further accentuating the contrast between British and continental styles in theoretical physics at the turn of the century. As we reach the conclusion of our exploration into the ether-based electron models of Lorentz and Larmor, we have gained valuable insight into the rich tapestry of theoretical physics during a pivotal era. These models, while rooted in the concept of the ether, showcase distinct approaches and philosophical underpinnings. Lorentz's electron model striving for a unified physical theory sought to derive optics from electrodynamics. His meticulous efforts to generalise Maxwell's treatise and adapt it to the electron theory demonstrated his dedication to forging connections between fundamental concepts. On the other hand, Larmor, guided by his belief in the primacy of the rotational ether, embraced a more monistic viewpoint, incorporating the ether as a fundamental construct. Through our exploration, we have witnessed the clash of ideas, the divergence in interpretations, and the impact of these models on the development of theoretical physics. From the intricate interplay between optics and electrodynamics to the complex notion of charge, current and displacement, Lorentz and Larmor presented unique perspectives that sparked intense debates and pushed the boundaries of scientific understanding. While Lorentz and Larmor may have differed in their ultimate conclusions, their contributions paved the way for future advancements. The quest for a unified physical theory persisted guiding subsequent generations of physicists towards new insights and discoveries. As we conclude this series, we are reminded that scientific progress is built upon the exchange of ideas, the clash of theories and the relentless pursuit of knowledge. The exploration of ether-based electron models has unveiled the intricacies of theoretical physics during a transformative period, highlighting the enduring impact of these visionary thinkers. Now, this is by no means the end of the story, as there are many other avenues to explore, both in terms of other ether-based theories of this time, such as Kelvin's vortex model, and how his approach is being used in a totally different way. I would also like to explore more modern ether-based theories and the potential experimental evidence of an ether. One big question that still cannot be answered is what exactly is charge? And in this respect, I do like Larmor's consideration of the fact that positive charge is created through the same structure as the negative charge. I would be interested in hearing your suggestions for any of these in terms of papers or experimenters who have looked into these areas. So if you have any ideas, please leave them down below in the comments. Thank you for joining me on this enlightening voyage through the realms of ether-based electron models. As we continue to explore the frontiers of theoretical physics and delve into new realms of knowledge, I kindly ask for your continued support by subscribing to the channel, sharing my content and participating in the ongoing discussions. You contribute to the vibrant community of curious minds dedicated to unravelling the mysteries of the universe. 
Once again, I extend my heartfelt appreciations to each and every one of you for joining me on this exhilarating journey. Let us embark on the next chapter together as we embrace the wonders of theoretical physics and unravel the secrets of the universe. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.